This is the Learn Jazz Standards Podcast, episode 106. Welcome to the LJS Podcast, where you get weekly jazz tips, interviews, stories, and advice for becoming a better jazz musician. And now your host, he's a jazz musician, author, and entrepreneur, Brent Bartstra. All right, what's up, everybody? My name is Brent. I am the jazz musician behind the website LearnJazzStandards.com, which is a blog and a podcast and videos all geared towards helping you become a better jazz musician. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thanks for hanging out today. And wow, I just want to say, first of all, uh, a big thank you to everybody who participated in our podcast raffle back in February. Man, that was super awesome. Uh, And we just got a lot of uh, reviews on iTunes. I got a lot of suggestions from you from future episodes. So I just want to thank everybody publicly first, just for participating in that and just helping out. I really appreciate it. And I just sent out emails to 17 lucky winners of our raffle. And I'm not going to name all of you because because you know, you know who you are. I've sent you an email, but I want to publicly thank our number one winner who won both of our jazz courses, our ear training course, How to Play What You Hear, and our practicing course, 30 Days to Better Jazz Playing, as well as our entire library of jazz standard playalongs, Megan Campbell from Seattle, Washington. So thank you so much, Megan, and congratulations. Uh, I really appreciate you being a listener, and I appreciate everybody who participated uh, in our competition. Now, last week on the podcast, we started Jazz Standards Month. Sometimes we do themes on this podcast where we hone in on one specific topic for an entire month and just really try to get inside of that topic. And so for the month of March, we are doing Jazz Standards Month. So I'm excited about this. And last week, we talked about analyzing jazz standards with Roman numerals and how by doing this, we can really unlock the song that we're learning. We can understand it better. We can understand the harmony. And it's going to set us up for success in the long run when it comes to playing and performing this particular tune. Well, today we're going to talk about step number two, which is all about mapping out the song. Okay, We're going to be discovering what chord tones we can use in that song and what are the important notes that we need to hone in on to really get those chords changes to come out. And by doing this, we're going to be setting ourselves up for success when we go to improvise over this particular jazz standard. Okay. So I'm really excited about this. And also along with jazz standards month, I'm excited because in April, we're going to be launching our brand new ebook and companion course, the jazz standards playbook. And I'm really excited about this book because it goes through 10 jazz standards studies of jazz standards that are important to know. But more than that, it's important to dig into them and look into their improvisational stories and their uh, lessons that they can teach us because it's going to help us in the long run uh, just be able to play jazz so much better no matter what song it is. So I'm really excited about that book. If you want to be the first one to get notified when that comes out, go to the jazzstandardsplaybook.com and you'll be on our list. All right, without further ado, let's jump into today's show. All right, you can find the show notes for today's show at learnjazzstandards.com forward slash episode 106. Now, you don't need to look at the show notes for today's episode to get lots of value out of it. And by the way, that's my goal every single week is just to offer you as much value as I possibly can so you have something to walk away and take to, into action. But you don't need the show notes today. It's gonna, it could be helpful for you because uh, I will have some musical examples, but you will get just as much out of it just by listening. So no worries if you can't access those show notes right now. Okay, so we're talking about mapping out a jazz standard today, and for today, we're going to use an example, the jazz standard All of Me, which I think everybody knows uh, that song, All of Me. If you don't know it, that's okay. Look it up. It's a Gerald Marks tune, and it's uh, really important to know. Now, when we're talking about mapping out a song of any kind, in this case, a jazz standard, I'm talking about looking into the different chord tones that we can explore and use in our improvisation. Now, in the Jazz Standards Playbook, I talk about a couple different kinds of mapping, but we're just going to focus on the very basic, the fundamental building blocks of mapping out the jazz standard. And like I said in the intro, last week we talked about analyzing a song by Roman numerals. But now we're going to dig a little bit deeper because we want to know what those chords actually mean in and of themselves. So the best place to start, and this may or may not be a review for you, is just to make sure that you know exactly what makes up the different kinds of seventh chords. Now, seventh chords are the standard kinds of chords that are used in jazz, okay? Oftentimes, we're, we're dealing with seventh chords rather than just triads. So it's important to know the formulas of them. And I'm going to go over those really quickly right Right now. So here's the seventh chord formulas in case you don't know them already. For a major seven chord, the formula is root, third, fifth, seventh. 
Okay, root third, fifth, seventh. For a dominant seventh chord, it's root third, fifth, flat seven. So the only difference is we're flatting the seven now. The formula for a minor seventh chord is root flat three, five, flat seven. So now the only difference between the dominant seventh chord and the minor seventh chord is we're flatting the three. The formula for a half diminished chord, or AKA the minor seven flat five chord, is the root, the flat three, the flat five, and the flat seven. Formula for a diminished seventh chord is root flat three, flat five, double flat seven. Okay, double flat seven. So we're flatting the seventh twice, and that's a diminished seventh chord. So if you have those formulas unlocked, what I would encourage you to do is is just to make sure, in case you don't really have this stuff down already, is regardless of whether you're playing a horn and you're gonna arpeggiate the stuff, or if you're a guitar or piano player and you'll be comping the stuff. Start taking through all 12 keys those different qualities of chords, those five major qualities, the major seventh chord, the dominant seventh, the minor seventh, half diminished chord, and the diminished seventh chord. Make sure you can play those chords in all 12 keys and you will be in great shape. So if you haven't done that, that's if you haven't done that yet specifically or are able to do that, that's what I want you to take out of this episode today. I want you to uh, you know feel feel free to listen to the rest of the episode, but what I want you to practice this week is is just doing that, taking those different chords through all 12 keys. Uh, arpeggiate them or voicing them. And of course, if you're a piano player, or guitar player, there's a bunch of different ways you can voice those chords. You know, piano players have their own sets of uh, voicings and guitar players have their own sets of voicings. And you can play the different inversions of those. Like instead of starting on the root, start on the third or start on the fifth or start on the seventh, right? That'd be root position or first inversion, second inversion. Um, you know, so go through those different inversions and be able to play through them. And likewise, if you are a saxophone player or a trumpet player or any kind of horn player, not a comping instrument, you could do the same thing. You can practice arpeggiating chords starting on the third or starting on the fifth and moving up from there. And what that's going to do is that's going to ensure that you really know the notes that are in that particular chord. Okay. So that's a great practice. It's not just for piano players, guitar players, comping instruments. It's great for everybody to practice arpeggiating or playing these different qualities of chords in different positions, root, first inversion, second version, so on and so forth, okay? So that's the first thing that I want you to know. Now, I've talked about this before in a previous podcast episode quite a long time ago, uh, all about guide tones, okay? And that's what we're going to talk about next, finding and identifying the guide tones in a jazz standard, in, in, in the different chords in a jazz standard. Now, what are the guide tones? Now, I'm going to cut straight to the chase, all right? The guide tones are the thirds and the sevenths of each chord. Okay, let me say that again. The guide tones are the thirds and the sevenths of each chord. Now, why are they called guide tones? The reason they're called guide tones is because they are literally guiding you from one chord to the next, the major differences between each one of those chords. Now, if we go back to our seventh chord formulas that we just talked about, if we look through the differences of all these chords, we are almost always going to see that it's the difference of the third or the seventh between each chord type. For example, a major seventh chord, as I said, is root, third, fifth, seventh. Well, a dominant seventh chord, what's the difference there? The flat seven. If we go to the minor seventh chord, what's the difference between the dominant and the minor seven? It's the flat three, and then the rest is just, so in other words, if we have a root, third, fifth, flat seven, that's a dominant seventh chord, but minor seven is root flat three, five, flat seven. So that's what makes that a minor seventh chord, and it's the third that's being changed. Now, it's true that when we get to half diminished chords, when we get to diminished chords, there is that flat five in there, okay? But that's still not the most powerful notes in that chord. I like to think of the third and seventh as, in a way, uh, the skeleton, you know, it's kind of the thing that's like holding the chord together in one place. It's sort of like the pivot point. You know, it's like, it's kind of like you have, uh, oh, I don't know, you have like a, a merry-go-round, right? And, you know, there's this thing that's rotating, going in a circle, right? But there's these the structure that's holding it right in place. And I like to think of that as the thirds and sevenths. And a lot of people will say, well, that would be the root, right? The root would be the, the, the centerpiece of the merry-go-round. No, I think it's the third and sevenths because the third and sevenths are going to tell me what is going to go on with this chord. What's going to happen between this chord and the next chord? 
Okay, so to make sure that we understand this, let's do this in the context of a 2-5-1 chord progression in the key of concert C. So what is that? That's a D minor 7, that's a G7, and that's a C major 7. In last episode, we talked about how to build those chords based on Roman numerals, so go ahead and check that episode after you listen to this one if you're not familiar with that one yet. Okay, so here's what a 2-5-1 sounds like. Okay, so D minor 7, G7, C major 7. Now let's go ahead and in each chord identify the guide tones, the thirds and the sevenths, so that we know what they are in this chord progression. Okay, let's start with D minor 7. What's the third? The third is F natural, okay? The seventh is C, okay? It's that flat 7, C. Now what's the thirds and sevenths in G, okay? The third is B natural, and the seventh is F. Again, that's that flat 7 there. And in C major 7, the third is E natural, and the seventh is B. That's the major 7th, okay? So one more time, the third and seventh in D minor 7, it's F and C. In G7, it's F and B, or sorry, B and F. <laughs> third, third is B, the seventh is F. And then in C major 7, it's E and B, okay? So here's what this sounds like if you're going to just play these. I'm just going to do whole notes uh, for each bar, uh, the thirds and sevenths played together at the same time. Okay, now hopefully you notice that even though we were just playing two notes for each of those chords and there is no root, in other words, there's no bass note in that chord, you are still able to hear that harmonic movement, okay? And that's the power of guide tones, is that harmonic movement you're able to hear. Now, let's play them separately. And, and so what I mean separately, I mean that we're gonna play half notes for each note. So the third we're gonna play for two beats, and then the seventh we're gonna play for two beats, and then we're gonna move on to the next chord. And we're gonna apply something called voice leading. Now, what is voice leading, okay? Voice leading is the smooth melodic movement of notes or voices from one chord to the next. So in other words, when we're thinking about voice leading uh, notes together, whatever notes there, whether it's melodic notes in a melody or whether we're talking about the guide tones, we're talking about finding the nearest possible note in the next chord that we can hit. So in other words, we're gonna find the nearest one intervolically that we can hit. So if we're talking about D minor seven, the third is F, and then we're playing up to the seventh, which is C, what's the nearest note that we can play in G? seven. Well, the third is B. And so C and B, those are only a half step away from each other. So in other words, instead of going to the seventh, which is an F, that's an entire fourth interval away, we would be going to B because it's only a half step away. Now, again, if you go to the show notes, I have an example of this. So you can kind of see this a little bit clearer and how this is working here. Uh, but then let's, so let's move on. So we just resolve to, to B, which by the way, Resolving from a seventh of one chord to the third of the next chord is a really strong movement. It really defines the chord when you land on the third. Now, again, that's not a rule like you always have to do that in your improvisation, but just know that that's a real powerful way to spell out the changes. So now we're on the third of G7, which is B natural, and then we're going to go down to the seventh, which is F natural. Now we need to voice lead that F natural, the flat seven, to the third of the C major seven, okay? So, and when I said third, because if you think about it, the third is the closest note from F natural, which is the seventh of G seven. The third of C major seven is E natural. Again, we're talking about a half step difference. So from F to E natural is a half step, and F is the flat seven of G seven, and E natural is the third of C major seven, okay? So we just voice led those together, and then we can play up to the seventh of C major seven, which is B natural, okay? And the other thing for you to notice here too, and again, this is a very visual thing, but hopefully you can track with me by just listening to this audio here, is that the third, in the case when we're, when we're cycling in force, like a two, five, one is, and a lot of chord progressions in jazz do cycle in force, like D is uh, a fourth away from G, and G is a fourth away from C, D minor 7, G7, C major 7, we get this cool thing that happens where the third of one chord is the seventh of the next. For example, in D minor 7, the third is F, okay? In, well, the flat 3 is F. In G7, the seventh, the flat 7 is F, okay? Pretty interesting, right? That's really interesting. 
Um, f- another example here. In G7, the third is B. Okay, the third is B. In C major 7, the seventh is B. Pretty interesting, right? So in other words, you have this interesting thing where you're sharing notes with each chord, but they they have different functions, different roles. You know, one is the third, one is the seventh of the next. Pretty interesting stuff. Okay, let's listen to what this sounds like voice-led and which each with, with each guide tone played separately. Okay? Da di da 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 di right? That that voice led guide tones playing through that chord progression. Okay, so hopefully that you understand now how that works. If you did it already, you understand how guide tones work, what they are, the thirds and sevenths of each chord, and how they can voice lead together, all right? And we could hear with that voice leading, with those melodic guide tones we just played, we could hear those chord changes come out, right? And you didn't even have to play uh, a bunch of crazy bebop lines or anything. You could still hear the function of those chords. Okay, so now let's go uh, and, and and essentially, this is what I would do. I would take a jazz standard that I'm learning. In this case, I'm going to use all of me as an example. And I would map out those guide tones on that on that tune, okay? These are, the like I said, this is like the center of the merry-go-round. This is the structure. This is the skeleton that I want to deal with. And so when I'm starting to try to discover how to improvise over this, I want to start with this because these are the money notes, right? These are the guide tones. So what I'm going to play for you now is an example of doing melodic guide tones, so so voice-led guide tones over the entire form of All of Me, okay? So here's what it sounds like. Now, one more time before we move on, I'll reiterate the importance of these guide tones. If you just listen to that, we are already starting to come up with a solo, right? I mean, you could hear movement in those guide tones. I mean, you could hear the chords come out in those guide tones. Even if you took away the comping, the left hand comping in there, you'd be able to hear that song come out. And that's why that's so important. Now, we're going to move on to the next step here with the mapping, which is simply now we're going to actually take the chord tones the entire set of chord tones. Now, again, um, it, without dealing with alterations or anything like that in each one of these chords, if you just treat them as their basic functionality, we're dealing with four notes here, right? The root, the third, the fifth, and the seventh. And we already went over those seventh chord formulas. So as long as you know your seventh chord formulas and you can play those in all 12 keys, therefore you can you know, play whether it's a C major seven or if it's an E flat major seven, you know how to spell out that chord, you're basically ready to go. Um, So now what I'm going to do is play you an exercise that I did compose for the Jazz Standards Playbook, the book coming out in April. Um, And essentially what I do is I outline all of the different chord tones of each chord, but I do it in a little bit of a, I guess, a motific way. So there's a rhythm to it. Basically, I'm, I'm doing a quarter note and eighth note rhythm, and you'll hear it when I when I play the exercise, but I'm literally just taking each chord and I'm going through each one of those chord tones. Now, again, like I discussed before, it's important that you're able to still construct these chords or arpeggiate these chords, um, starting on different chord tones, like going from the third up to the root, right? Rather than the root to the seventh. 
So it's a, you're, it's important that you're able to you know mix and match these different ways, and that's what I do in this exercise. Now, if you're just starting from the very beginning, you don't have to do fancy uh, exercise or do rhythms or patterns or anything like that. You can just simply look at each chord of each uh, in the chord progressions in the song and just go and voice them from root to the seventh up, just to make sure you got them. Like I said, getting that those basics down. But I find this exercise is helpful, and I will have it available uh, on for for completely free on the show notes, learnjazzstandards.com forward slash episode 106. So let's take a listen to this. So if you just listen to that now, you probably thought, hey, I'm starting to hear some music come out here, right? Now, it's not completely musical yet, right? I mean, we're kind of just dealing with stagnant rhythms, and we're just playing the chord tones. But you can at least hear those chords come out when you play that, right? I mean, you can hear what's going on. And in addition to that, I applied voice leading into that exercise. So essentially, we're starting with a quarter note going... And so that next note that I connected in the next chord was voice led by a half step. So it wasn't necessarily the root of that chord, but I knew that, you know, starting on that third and we build it up from there, I know how to build that chord. And so I'm applying voice leading and I'm applying um, the, you know, spelling out these, uh, these different uh, chords, which we went over that earlier. Okay. And so what all of this is, is it's a good starting point. It's a firm foundation. So if we combine our knowledge of guide tones, those money notes, the thirds and sevenths, and voice leading, okay, connecting them melodically together. And then we also combine our knowledge of how to build basic seventh chords. And we know how to do that. Well, suddenly we've got all of the important notes that are in each chord that we can learn how to connect together. So if you've mapped out all of that for yourself, whether you've actually hand notated that down or you just did that by ear and you can make up your own exercises over different jazz standards, you don't have to just follow that one. Well, then you have a really firm foundation for moving on from there, which we're going to talk a little bit more in the next episode. But you have that foundation that's so important. And so I kind of want to leave it there today. I want to just leave you there with, with that knowledge. What I want to do for you is I want to give you a challenge for you to work on this week. I want you to find a jazz standard that you're working on. And I want you to intentionally map out those guide tones and see if you can't voice lead them together. And then I want you to map out the chord tones, okay? And one other thing I want to point out is why did I start with the guide tones? Why didn't I just start with the chord tones, right? And then narrow it down to the guide tones. Again, those guide tones are central to me. So it's one thing you, you have to, of course, know how to spell out these chords. I already talked about that. But it's important that you know what those important notes are. And if you're keeping those in the back of your head the whole time and you know you start developing an ear for that, again, we want to be intellectually thinking about this stuff all the time. We have to maybe start by intellectually thinking about this stuff, but eventually it just wants to be all ears, right? We want it to be all ears. We have great ears to hear these things, but you have to start somewhere. And this is a good starting point. Now, in the book, I do take things a little further. Um, we eventually uh, do uh, the jazz standard Stella by Starlight, but we do a, an even more in-depth note mapping where we're combining different scales and modes over top of that stuff and starting to think about those as pitch collections that we can draw even more notes, even more color tones into that. But this is the basic starting point, okay? So my challenge, again, is for you to pick a jazz standard this week and map out the guide tones, voice lead them in your own way, and practice playing the chord tones over that. And if you can really hone in on that next week, 
that's that's a good week's worth worth of work. That's really going to set you up for success. So take action, guys. I mean, this is I mean, it's one thing you can listen to podcast episodes, you can read books, you can you know go to master classes, you can do all that stuff. But unless you take action, nothing's ever going to happen, right? But I think you know that. Okay, so dive into this this week. Start mapping out these jazz standards. All right, thank you so much for listening. That's all for today's show. Remember, you can find some of these musical examples I talked about today at the show notes, learnjazzstandards.com forward slash episode 106. And hey, if you're thinking to yourself, man, I really enjoy this podcast, which I over the weeks, I've really heard a lot from you guys talking about how much you love this podcast and are getting out of it. And I really appreciate those. But if you're thinking, man, I want some more. Well, guess what? Uh, at Learn Jazz Standards, we're producing a lot of content. In fact, we're, we produce three new pieces of content every single week in different mediums. On Mondays, we come out with this podcast. On Wednesdays, we come out with a blog post, which is usually a lesson or tutorial on our website, learnjazzstandards.com. And on Thursdays, we come out with a new video on our YouTube channel, uh, usually a jazz lesson or tutorial as well. So there's so much content that we're coming out with each week, all to help serve you, to help you become a better jazz musician. So if you want more, go to those mediums. But more importantly, if you haven't gotten onto our newsletter list, then I want you to do that because I'm going to tell you every single week when those come out so that you never have to miss any of that stuff um, and get so much more value. So if you want to do that, go to learnjazzstandards.com forward slash join. And the bonus perk of that, is, and if you, you know this, if you've already subscribed to the newsletter, which many of you have, is that you get a free ebook, our ultimate jazz guide to practicing for doing that. And it's a real valuable book. Um, over 35,000 people have downloaded that book and are getting a lot of value out of that. So sign up for our newsletter, learnjazzstandards.com forward slash join. And one more call to action. If you want to get notified when the Jazz Standards Playbook and Companion course comes out, that's the jazzstandardsplaybook.com. You can sign up there if you want to be uh, one of those raving diehard fans and sign up early. All right, I'm looking forward to seeing you in next week for episode 107. See you back then. Thanks for listening to the LJS Podcast, brought to you by LearnJazzStandards.com. Subscribe to the series on iTunes, and don't forget to join our jazz community at LearnJazzStandards.com forward slash newsletter.